Ja, um unser schönes Europa, um das, was auch mal besser bestellt. 2018 war geprägt vom Brexit und von nationalen Alleingängen. Und dieses Jahr könnte Europa noch weiter auseinanderdriften. Denn im Mai wird das Europäische Parlament gewählt und rechten Parteien wird ein Triumph vorausgesagt. Was tun? Wer, wenn nicht der Superstar-Ökonom und Politaktivist Yannis Varoufakis, könnte uns Antworten darauf geben. Der ehemalige griechische Finanzminister tritt nämlich zur Europawahl an. Und das, jetzt kommt's, in Deutschland. Varoufakis ist Spitzenkandidat von Demokratie in Europa, einer Partei, die Menschen aus mehreren europäischen Ländern ins Rennen schickt. Warum als Grieche in Deutschland kandidieren, wie lassen sich die Linke und Europa erneuern und warum wir mehr Science-Fiction lesen sollten. Über das und noch mehr habe ich mit Varoufakis für den Dissens-Podcast gesprochen. Der Dissens-Podcast sendet üblicherweise auf Deutsch, das Gespräch hier aber ist auf Englisch. Eine deutsche und gekürzte schriftliche Fassung gibt es auf unserer Internetseite www.dissenspodcast.de. Der Link dazu auch in den Shownotes. Mein Name ist Lukas Ondreka, ihr hört den Dissens-Podcast. Dissens, der Podcast für linke Gesellschaftskritik. Elections in Europe are coming up and here in Germany people can vote on May 26. And if they want to, they can actually vote for Greek, Yanis Varoufakis. Yanis, you're joining Dissens from your home in Athens. Yes. You're the front runner for the newly found party Democracy in Europe, which is the electoral wing of the pan-European movement DM25. Tell us, why do you run from Germany? To symbolize that there is no clash between Germany and the rest of Europe, but there is only a clash between uh, progressive uh, policies and uh, authoritarianism. Uh, Europe is in the midst of a systemic crisis that affects all of us in different ways. But unless a democratic transnational movement takes hold in the heart of Europe, which is Germany, it will simply not succeed. Germany is to Europe today that which Rome was to the Roman Empire. If you wanted to start a movement to reform the Roman Empire, you should start it in Rome. Sure, you being a Greek getting voted for in Germany, this symbolizes a transnational Europe. But in the current situation, it represents almost a middle finger, I think, to the fascists on the one side and to the technocrats of sorts of Wolfgang Schäuble on the other side. It is a statement that we do not recognize the logic of us against them, whoever the us and whoever the them might be. It is a rejection of both the Schäuble-like attitude towards uh, a fragmented Europe that is only united by a common currency and to the vision of the racists, the xenophobes, the nationalists, the fascists, who want uh, to utilize the discontent that these failed policies at the level of Europe uh, are, is creating in order to gain strength within their own countries and uh, to turn their populations against each other. I read that in order for you to be able to run in Germany um, for the European Parliament, You had to prove uh, that you are a resident in Germany and for that you rented an apartment of a friend. So you kind of hacked the election rules. Did anyone do that before? Well, I didn't hack anything. Uh, what we did was we followed the rules. Uh, the rules say that you have to have a residence in Germany uh, well in advance of the election uh, in order to qualify to be a candidate. So we followed the rules and I did uh, rent an apartment from a friend in Berlin and I registered as a resident. And we are going to have at least one German national running, competing in the election, in the European Parliament election here in Greece to demonstrate in practice that we do not recognize that there is any conflict between our countries. Another Europe is not just possible, but it is already here. DiEM25 and Democracy in Europe in Germany are part of a pan-European alliance, which is called European Spring. In how many countries does European Spring run in the elections? Well, the European Spring uh, comprises, as you said, DiEM25 and a number of other parties and movements that are joining us. Uh, so let me run a list for you. In Poland, we are being represented by Razum. In Denmark, by Alternativet. Uh, now we are going to have a new list in Belgium. It was only voted for last week. Uh, soon we are going to announce that we are going to run in, in, in Austria, but this is, has not been finalized yet, but I have every confidence that we will run in Austria as well. In France, we are 
Running with the Generation and my friend and colleague Benoit Amon. In uh, Spain, Actua has joined officially the European Spring. In Portugal, Livre, and of course in Greece, Mera 25. This is the last uh, count, if you want. And we hope that by May we will have other countries that are participating in other movements. This year, there will also be elections in your home country, Greece. Depending on the fragility of the Syriza-led government, they might even be early elections coinciding with the European election in May. You declared that you will run for a seat back home in Athens. Um, if you get elected in both parliaments, the national and the European, so what will you choose, like the national parliament or then the European parliament? Oh, indeed, indeed. It is very important to be absolutely upfront and transparent and tell voters in every country uh, what our intentions are. It's very likely, I would give it more than a 70% chance, that on the day of the European Parliament election, we're going to have national elections. So if this happens, I will be, for symbolic reasons, you know, leading the, the list in Germany. And of course, if I get elected, I will immediately resign from the European Parliament and concentrate on uh, the Greek Parliament. If uh, the European election takes place first... And in the hypothetical case that I am elected uh, in Germany as a, a European MP, I will uh, attend uh, European Parliament. I will m make one or two speeches there to set the scene and immediately resign, ceding my positions to um, Daniela Plach, who is uh, my number two, and then concentrate on the national elections in Greece. Okay, I see the national parliament has priority for you. And is that because you feel that you can have more of an influence there? <laughs> Look, Greece is uh, uh, in a state of great depression. We are losing tens of thousands of young men and women every month to emigration. This uh, country of ours is being buffeted by a 10-year-old uh, crisis that is almost existentialist. Not almost, it is existentialist. The, the, the future of, the, of this country is at stake. I have a responsibility to fight on behalf of the people of Greece, while at the same time continuing to signal to the rest of the world that the fight for progressive politics is pan-European. It is as much Greek as it is German, as it is French, as it is Polish, and so on and so forth. Yeah, I, I mean, your background is a game theorist, so it can't be as simple as win or lose or take one parliament. Um, how is learning German coming about? Do you learn German in order to run here and address the German voters? I wish I had the time to do it. I feel very embarrassed that I don't speak German. There is a cassette of me speaking German as, an, as a seven-year-old, because when I was five, six, seven, eight, I used to speak German, apparently. But then English kicked in and my German just fell by the wayside. Uh, I wish I, I had the time to, 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 to concentrate, to, to learn sufficient German in order to be able to address you and the public in Germany. But let me make a point, a political point. You will uh, have noticed that uh, anti-Europeans, especially British Eurosceptics, have this argument that the European Union can never work because there can never be a European demos. And the reason why there can never be a European demos, demos is because we don't have, unlike the Americans, let's say, a common language. Now, if they are right, then indeed the European Union has no future. If it, if it cannot be democratized because there is no European demos, it's going to fail. But as DiEM25, our response to this has always been that it is possible to have a civic ideology as Europeans and therefore to create a European demos, even if we don't have a common language. I guess not having a common language makes it more difficult for us Europeans, but not impossible. So I share your point of view on that. But anyway, uh, do you remember some words in German from your childhood? Oh, yes, yes. I remember my, my mother giving me various speeches in German. My mother was a fluent uh, German speaker. So let's say, wir haben viel zu tun. <laughs> Dir gefällt der Dissens Podcast, dann werde doch Mitglied. Denn wir brauchen deine Unterstützung, damit Dissens weiter senden kann. Helfen kannst du uns schon mit 2 Euro im Monat und für das Geld winken Bonusinhalte. Also mach mit, denn du hast gehört, wir haben viel zu tun. Alle Infos hierzu gibt es auf unserer Internetseite www.dissenspodcast.de. Der Link auch in den Shownotes. Als kleine Besonderheit verlosen wir unter allen Leuten, die bis zur nächsten Dissens-Folge in einer Woche Mitglied werden, ein Varoufakis-Buch. 
Infos hierzu am Ende dieser Episode. Also dranbleiben. Hier ist der Dissens Podcast. Zu Gast ist Janis Varoufakis. Janis, you're an economist first and foremost. And one could say only by accident you were thrown onto the center stage of politics in the Greek debt negotiation crisis. Do you sometimes yearn for simply being an economist and teacher again and leaving the messy field of politics? Well, in one word, yes. I never wanted to, be, to enter politics. I was very happy as an academic, uh, writing my obscure academic articles. <laughs> uh, but it was only around the early 2000s when uh, I started feeling that the world around me was heading for a monumental crisis, a crisis like that of the 1920s and 30s, that would create um, uh, political monsters and that it would um, be a, a clear and present danger for generations to come. It was only then that I moved away from the very obscure game theoretical texts that I loved uh, engaging with and models. And I started writing about uh, financial flows, about trade flows, about the way in which capitalism was procuring uh, impossible imbalances that at some point would blow up. So, yes, you're right. I mean, the only reason why you know me is because uh, of the massive crisis of 2008 and the particular impact of that crisis in Greece. And so when you ask, ask me the question, do I wish that that crisis never happened so that I could stay in my academic obscurity, the answer is yes, absolutely yes. But then again, I don't regret having thrown my hat into the political ring, given that this crisis has happened. I'm also asking because I think your strong suit is especially in explaining complex economic issues to normal people like me. And sometimes I think that the business of think tanking might suit you better than the politics realm. And the left could use a good think tank, a think tank like the neoliberal said in the right moment of time with the Mont Pelerin Society, for example. Well, you know, we do not control history and we do not control our place in history. I would be more comfortable being in a think tank, being in a university environment, in an academic environment, behind the scenes. Uh, I'd, I, I personally dislike seeking votes and asking for people to vote for me. Uh, but then, then again, um, if, you, if you look at the way neoliberals created their ideological armor through the Mont Pelerin Society and so on, uh, they were very well funded. They were doing a, for many, many years before the crisis of capitalism that brought neoliberalism to the fore. Uh, the left does not have this kind of infrastructure. And now it's too late. We are in the middle of a humanitarian crisis. We're in the middle of an ecological catastrophe with climate change. Uh, this is uh, our generation's uh, moment of truth. We need to be out there on the streets, uh, in the electoral process, in the universities, uh, in the media, to fight the political struggle and the ideological struggle. What I try to do is I try to remain as academic as I can within the realm of politics. In other words, uh, you will hear me question my own beliefs quite often. Uh, that's why, for instance, many people are surprised that I call myself an inconsistent, erratic Marxist, because I do believe that you've got to be erratic Uh, you've got to be able to question yourself. Everybody who is completely convinced about their own views is a fanatic and a dangerous fool. Uh, so it's important at this juncture to combine self-criticism and academic mindset with political activism. Uh, and I don't feel that there is time or resources to do anything different. I like that you brought up that you're an erratic Marxist because the logo of this podcast is Marx himself, but ironically with the sunglasses on. <laughs> and Marx's mantra was first and foremost that we always have to doubt ourselves and always doubting yourself. I think that's something very important in nowadays complicated world. Indeed, indeed. And let's never forget that the left has committed m massive crimes against humanity and against itself. The gulag was invented so that communists go in it. And we must always uh, remain skeptical of the left as leftists. This is something that many leftists don't like hearing from me, but I will keep repeating it because uh, as the Spanish anarchists during the Spanish Civil War used to say, and they were completely correct, we need uh, not just a red flag, but also a black flag because red is excellent as a symbol of revolution. 
and the heart and enthusiasm, but also black must be there as a reminder of the darkness inside all of us. Regarding the left and the European election, there are some people that say there exist already well-established uh, left-wing coalitions in Europe, and therefore there's no need for a transnational European spring-like uh, movement or wing. There's, for example, the party of the European left, which unites left-wing parties from different European countries. Syriza, the Greek left-wing coalition, for example, that you were part of during your tenure as Greece finance minister, this is part of the European left. And here in Germany, you have Die Linke, which is also organized in the European left. So why do we need another left project running in the European elections? Because the party of the European left is shrinking and becoming increasingly irrelevant for a very, very simple reason. They don't have a common program about Europe. Even Die Linke does not have a common program about Europe. To our detriment and with sadness, we note that the link is divided. There is a wing, which is Europeanist, like DiEM25, and indeed um, they are my comrades, my friends, Katia Keeping and many, many others uh, who were part of DiEM25 when we began. Uh, they have the same views that we do about the importance of transnationality, the importance of taking over the institutions of the European Union and making them work for the many, not for the few. Uh, but then there is another faction in the Lincoln, which um, is arguing for the disintegration of the European Union, the disintegration of the Eurozone, and indeed they're even calling for limits to migration, limits to the number of refugees that should come into Germany. When you try to put together these two different factions, and to get them to agree to a common manifesto, you end up with the lowest common denominator. And the lowest common denominator manifesto that you end up with is vacuous, it's empty, empty of meaning. And at a time when Alternative for Deutschland are very clear and very coherent in what they want, they want terrible things, but they're very clear about what they want, for the left to have this lowest common denominator is appalling. It is effectively an abdication of duty. You mentioned the European left party. Well, the European Left Party comprises not just the Linke, but also, in some way, Jean-Luc Mélenchon was part of that, and Alexis Tsipras in Greece. The Tsipras government has become completely and totally uh, subservient to the austerity policies and also the uh, anti-migrant policies of the European Union. And Jean-Luc Mélenchon is calling for the disintegration of the European Union and for a renationalization of politics. The result is the European Left Party uh, has absolutely no coherence. The last thing that the European voters need is uh, a European Left, which uh, speaks in a variety of languages and offers them a totally contradictory uh, view of the world, a non-manifesto. When we started as DiEM25, we had the great ambition of creating infrastructure uh, so that all the factions of the left could get together and agree on a common program. On this we failed. And it was only two years later, uh, after we realized that it was not possible to bring them all together, that we decided, well, what the hell, we have to run ourselves because we have a problem. We have the European Spring Program, which is called a New Deal for Europe. It is a coherent program, and we're going to run everywhere, in Germany, in Portugal, in Greece, in Denmark, with that program. This is what progressives need at this moment in time. Mm. Speaking of sectarianism, um, are you planning to form uh, your own faction of European Spring in the European Parliament? Or would you be open to join forces with other parties like the parties from the European left in, in the parliament and the faction? We will certainly collaborate with um, all progressives in the European Parliament. We have an, a duty to do this, especially when in the next European Parliament, the fascists, uh, the xenophobes, the racists are going to be overrepresented. We have to work together. Being non-sectarian is absolutely essential to us. Uh, we will never indulge in sectarianism. Yanis, let us briefly talk about another initiative that you launched quite recently, the so-called Progressive International. You launched this Progressive International in the United States together with the Sanders Institute, a think tank loosely affiliated with U.S. Senator and Democratic Socialist Bernie Sanders. 
This progressive international is supposed to unite the left all around the world and fight what you call a nationalist international of the sorts of Trump. So again, isn't that the responsibility of the already existing socialist international? Well, the socialist international is a joke. <laughs> it has become um, the bad of all jokes. Uh, it used to be a significant uh, movement once upon a time when Veli Brandt was still with us. Uh, but now it, it's... Um, It's not even taken seriously by the Social Democratic parties that supposedly belong to it. Uh, as for the rest of the progressive movements uh, around the world, uh, I don't think they've even heard of the Socialist International. The Socialist International has died uh, a very sad death some time ago. Look, if there was a progressive international, I would have joined it. Believe you me, the last thing I want is to create new movements and new organizations or to be part of the, their creation. I would love to. If, if, if something like Diem existed in Europe, we would not have created it. We would have joined it. The problem is that um, there is no such thing as an international organization, an umbrella organization that uh, seeks to come up with comprehensive, coherent answers to the questions that are Uh, torturing the mind of progressives around the world. What kind of rules do we want for finance? How can the financial genie go back into the bottle and finance can be serving the interests of, of, of the peoples around the world rather than vice versa? How do we fight poverty? How do we simultaneously fund the green transition and shift wealth from the global north to the global south? These are all questions that... Uh, um, are in the mind of progressives in Brazil, in India, in China, in Japan, in Germany, in Greece, in North America, in Mexico. Uh, isn't the time that we go together and we answer those questions uh, comprehensively? That is the whole point. Now, if the Socialist International or any other international were doing that, it would be fantastic and we would have joined them, but I'm afraid they are not. Yeah, right now the Progressive International is more or less a website with inspiring language and video. We will see if you are able to connect and practice uh, different left-wing groups, parties, uh, initiatives around the globe. What I was asking myself is, um, do you already start to reach out to other regions? Because... At the presentation of the Progressive International in the United States, only two regions were represented by uh, progressives, uh, Europe and North America. So what about Africa, Asia, Latin America? These are also important places. Oh, you're absolutely right. All we did was to issue an open call. And as you said, to create a website with an inspiration video, our intention is uh, to go and knock on doors in Asia, in Africa over the next six months, and we're doing it already, and uh, to bring around the table as many progressive forces to discuss these questions and start the process of compiling common answers to these common problems. Every six months we're going to be meeting in some other part of the world, but then The success or failure of the Progressive International will come from what happens in between those meetings, whether our council manages to, to um, um, energize enough members to keep working in real time continuously on these issues so that when we do meet every six months, Uh, there, are, there is progress in compiling this international Green New Deal, which would then become a fantastic, um, uh, if you want, facility, uh, resource for all progressive movements, because they will not need to reinvent the wheel in Mexico, in Nigeria, in uh, Bangladesh, when it comes to answering these common questions. Yanis, the elections ahead of us, the European Union seems in a really precarious state. A lot of the key states are run by right-wing governments successfully riding the wave of anti-EU resentment as well as xenophobia and racism towards migrants. And right-wing extremists threaten to gain ground in the parliament and divide Europeans even further. So how did we end up here? What are the underlying causes? 2008. I keep saying this because I believe it very, very strongly. 2008 was our generation's 1929. Uh, we had a monetary system prior to 2008, the global monetary system, financial system, that was creating gigantic bubbles of debt, private debt primarily, banking debt, and then the whole thing collapsed, just like in 1929. 
and the political forces that were in government, just like in 1929, tried to shift all the pain, all the losses, from the financial sector onto the shoulders of the taxpayers, and in particular, the weakest taxpayers, the working class. When you do that, just like in the 1930s, you end up with uh, a huge amount of discontent. And if you put together the discontent and the lack of hope and lack of a program from progressives, then suddenly this is such a great gift to demagogues of the right, to xenophobes, to racists. And now you can see that the CDU is being threatened from the right by the AfD. The difference with the 1930s is that uh, in the 1930s, industrial capital uh, funded the fascists. That has not happened yet in Europe, thankfully. But um, I wouldn't put past uh, our uh, oligarchy's capacities to do the same thing. So your point is that migration is only a symptom and not the reason for this crisis we are in. And that it is the financial crisis and the austerity politics that were put in place thereafter and are also ingrained in the European treaties. Take Germany. In Germany, you've got, what, 40, 50 percent of the population who are worse off today than they were 15 years ago. And that's clear from German government statistics. They are feeling squeezed. They are feeling that their services, um, health services, uh, kindergarten and so on, are falling behind. The infrastructure is falling behind. Their spending power is problematic. Now, even the middle class, they can see that their pension funds are being squeezed by negative interest rates. And that happens in a country that is swimming in money. You have a federal government that is in surplus, you have a huge trade surplus, you have uh, families that are saving more than ever before, and you have companies, corporations that are in, in surplus. Being in a country that is swimming in cash, while half of the population is feeling squeezed, is a fantastic realm on which uh, xenophobia can grow. Add to this, Germany is feeling that it is being part of a Eurozone that cannot sustain itself. And everybody turning to Germany and saying, you've got to pay for the rest of the Eurozone. When Germans feel that, yes, we are, we have all this cash, but we're not that rich to save the rest of Europe. If we were all functioning as a proper European Union, we would be able to share the burden of the refugees uh, across Europe. We would be able to look at it very dispassionately and coolly, something that is not possible simply because Europe is rudderless. Europe is not being governed. Even Mrs. Merkel has lost uh, uh, the capacity to project authority uh, in Germany and beyond. So, of course, everybody's mind is focused on the foreigner, but the reason why the foreigner becomes a problem is because we have failed to uh, shore up the economic and financial institutions and the social policy institutions of our own home, our countries, whether it's Germany, Greece, or the European Union as a whole. Mm -hmm. And when you say proper Europe, what do you mean by that? So what would be uh, the alternative to austerity politics and right-wing extremism? What does European Spring put forward? Investment. The tragedy of the European Union is that we have the lowest level of investment relative to savings in the history of the European Union since 1950. In other words, we have a mountain of savings, especially in Germany, but not only in Germany. Uh, and in comparison to the amount of savings that we have, our investment into things humanity needs, and by investment I don't, I don't mean buying bonds, I'm talking about you know, investment in productive capacity, especially in green productive the capacity in green energy, green and transport, the things that we need as Europeans in order to save our planet and to create a good quality jobs uh, that will um, put our young people in good stead for the future. This investment is much, much less than savings. So we need to boost uh, investment. How is this going to happen? The private sector is not doing it because the private sector is too scared that if they invest, they will be producing goods and services for which there will be not sufficient demand. Uh, our states cannot do it because of the fiscal compact, because they're fiscally stressed. Every state except Germany, perhaps, and maybe Holland, uh, are hitting fiscal constraints. But we have the European Investment Bank that could easily produce 
um, a very large number of bonds. We, as European Spring and DiEM25, we're proposing 500 billion euros of uh, bond issues from the European Investment Bank every year for five years to create a pool of money that goes into investment in green technology, green energy, green transport, which is something we really need in Europe. So no shared budget Macron style, which uh, failed like uh, only a few weeks ago. Oh, I'm all in favor for a shared budget, but it's this is not a time because, uh, as you know very well from Germany, the moment you start talking about a, a shared budget, uh, the, the, the question becomes, okay, so who is going to be legitimizing this? If you're going to have a, a shared budget, a shared uh, finance ministry, you need to have a shared parliament. You need a, a European parliament that has the capacity to empower and legitimize the shared budget. That we don't have. Effectively, we need a new democratic constitution for creating a federal government. Now, this discussion is one we must have. But you and I know that we cannot have it tomorrow. And if we start it tomorrow, it will end up in an impasse because most Europeans at the moment want less Europe, not more Europe, because they don't trust Europe. So what we need to do, and this is the DiEM25 position and the European Spring position, we need to create hope in Europe. We, and we need to use existing institutions under the existing treaties in order to solve major common problems. This is why I mentioned the European Investment Bank and the European Central Bank, because we have them. And the program, the investment program, the Green New Deal that I just outlined, is something that can be done tomorrow morning under the existing rules without violating any treaties and without any new treaties. So we can do it tomorrow morning. So if we do that, our audience will start thinking again of Europe as a source of solutions, not as a, as a source of, of problems. Suddenly Europe becomes again the realm of shared pr pr prosperity and then the mood changes and then we can have the discussion about a democratic federation that will take, of course, 10, 20 years. Uh, but that will only be possible if we change the mood. And to change the mood, we need to utilize existing institutions in ways that create good green jobs for millions of Europeans in Germany, in Greece, in Portugal, everywhere. The Green New Deal is something that's widely discussed among leftists. Um, I, th I think there are particularly two problems. The one is the problem of transformation. How do we transform capitalism, an unsustainable system, towards a system that is sustainable and the boundaries of our planet? The buzzword is post-growth. And the other thing is how do we, in this transformation, include the working class? Because in France, we could see that the gilet jaunes, the yellow vests, were fighting climate change policies because they were bad for them economically. So, What is your standpoint? and What's the standpoint of DiEM25 and European Spring on this issue? Oh, absolutely. We do not want more four-wheel drive diesel-driven cars. We do not want more physical growth. Uh, to put it succinctly, we believe in prosperity without physical growth. But we want some things to grow, not physical stuff. Uh, some physical stuff, you know, we want more solar panels. Yes, we want more growth of green energy. We want more green transport. Uh, but at the same time, we want more care. We need, we need more education. We want more health. We want massive growth in these things and big growth in the things that are destroying the planet and which are making our lives worse. So, for instance, you know, having... 600 different kinds of soap powder to choose from uh, <laughs> is not something that is contributing to prosperity. Uh, but to have uh, more uh, choice when it comes to education for our children, to have more choice when it comes to, to, to health options, uh, to living well, uh, to public health uh, programs, to green transport, to green energy, we want more of that. There's no doubt about that. So we need a lot more investment into prosperity without physical growth. But that takes money, you know. <laughs> so uh, we, that's, that's why we're, we're talking about a minimum of 500 billion euros every year to be spent on producing better quality of life, green transition, and all the things that make uh, communities function better without needing to fall prey to consumerism and to the growth of physical stuff that in the end takes away from our lives, does not add to them. Uh, 
Now, as far as the the um, the gilet jaune that you mentioned and the reaction of the working class against uh, climate change measures, they are absolutely right. Let's face it: after the two thousand and eight financial collapse, it was the weaker members of society that were, that were asked to shoulder the burden created by, you know, Goldman Sachs, Deutsche Bank, and so on and so forth. Uh, and now that climate change is becoming a major problem, again, they're being asked to shoulder the uh, the costs inflicted uh, upon the planet by the, the large corporations, by, you know, by Volkswagen and the rest. Uh, and that is both unfair and inefficient. Our position is this. Yes, we must put very large tax on carbon, on diesel, on all the polluting uh, substances, fuels and so on. But you can't ask the working class to pay for this. You see, when you increase the diesel tax in a place like France, the rich are not particularly upset by this because um, the proportion of their income that goes to diesel fuel is very, very small. When you have millions uh, of income, uh, then you pay another 10% in, in, in diesel tax, it means nothing to you. You don't even notice it. But if you're struggling to make ends meet, if you live in a rural area and you need a diesel-powered car in order to go to the shops, go to, the, to your job, or pick up your kids from school, then that may be the difference between putting food on the table and not putting food on the, on the table. So what is the solution? The solution is not to do nothing and not to increase fuel tax and diesel tax. It is important that we introduce, that we tax carbon heavily, but that tax must be neutral. It must be revenue neutral. The, 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 the amount of taxation, the receipts by the state from these taxes must be returned as income subsidies to the poor. So the poor can receive the money that they pay at the fuel pump back in the form of a subsidy, and then they can choose what they want to do with it. And if uh, you know the tax on diesel is high, they can they can use the income that the, that they receive in subsidies in order to choose uh, more green technologies, greener cars, electric cars, uh, and so on and so forth. So the solution for us is yes, we need to tax all those substances that are destroying the planet, but that must be a neutral tax and it must be returned to the poorer and weaker members of society, not to be absorbed in the, um, in, in the budget of the government and be used to give uh, tax exemptions to the rich. Mm -hmm. Talking transportation, physical stuff and the ecology, you are known to be a passionate bike rider. Would you be keen to switch that for some not so cool shared electric self-driving pot in the future? Well, I have to confess that I love riding my motorcycle. <laughs> <laughs> I wish I could ride this more. Uh, I don't have time to, so I'd cover a very few kilometers every year in these days. I have tried a fantastic uh, electric motorcycle uh, had packing a huge amount of power. And that was great fun. I would hate it to be self-driving, but I would love it to be electric so that I, I, I do my part for the environment. I read that you're working on your fifth mass market book. The working title is The Shaken Superflux. Uh, in that book, you paint possibilities for the year 2035. Sounds to me like science fiction a little bit. Can you give us a glimpse into your upcoming book and what the world will or could be in 2035? Yes, my book is going to be uh, an attempt at science fiction. I love sci science fiction. As Frederick Jameson said, science fiction is the archaeology of the future, is the best way of exploring the present and our present reality. So the, the, the book is a reaction to a criticism of my previous book, Talking to My Daughter About the Economy, uh, because it's what, that was all about how capitalism is. And the criticism that... Uh, stimulated the next book was that, okay, so you're very critical of capitalism. What is the alternative? <laughs> Maybe it's the best of all possible alternatives. So I needed to counter that. So in the end, I had to write uh, a new utopia to describe how the present could have been different, given our technologies without in, you know, imagining that we live in a Star Trek world where uh, machines 
produce everything, could social arrangements be very different and much better? That is the question. So I'm using science fiction methods in order to imagine a different trajectory that the world took after 2008. So I'm positing that in 2008, the crisis was so great that it uh, effectively uh, caused the uh, the, the, the time-space continuum to bifurcate. So a different trajectory started in 2008, leading to a completely different um, social organization. Uh, and in 2025, um, my protagonist in the book gained an insight into what life is like in the alternative traje trajectory through a wormhole, if you want to put it that way. I think it's quite important to also imagine the future positively because in recent pop culture the outlook on the future is more or less pessimistic in films and tv shows the future and social organization in future is almost always depicted in some kind of apartheid ghetto type of way and with star trek at least with the older tv shows that's a bit different there you have this optimistic view of expansion and knowledge seeking and human society so should we train ourselves in optimism and what can Star Trek teach us? That's right. That's right. It um, Star Trek for me, I mean, this, this is the reason why I like it and I prefer it massively to Star Wars because Star Wars is a kind of feudalism of, with a lot of technology. Um, but Star Trek is, um, if you want, the epitome of abundance communism, uh, humanist communism with abundance of material things which allows people to do that which uh, ancient Greek philosophers used to do, sitting in the Agora in ancient Athens and talking about uh, the meaning of life. So and that is a very optimistic, as you, as you put it, uh, image of how the world could be organized differently. Yanis, thank you so much for having joined us on the Descents podcast. It was a great pleasure. Das war Janis Varoufakis, Ökonom, Aktivist und vielleicht bald Mitglied des Europäischen Parlaments. Von Janis sind mehrere spannende Bücher erschienen. Zuletzt Adults in the Room, ein packender Politthriller über seine Zeit als griechischer Finanzminister und seinen Kampf mit Europas Establishment. Links zur englischen und zur deutschen Ausgabe in den Shownotes. Unter allen Leuten, die bis zur nächsten Dissensfolge kommende Woche eine Mitgliedschaft abschließen, verlosen wir eine englische Ausgabe von Adults in the Room. Also werdet Mitglied und sichert euch ein spannendes Buch. Dissens ist nur möglich, wenn ihr mitmacht. Dabei sein könnt ihr schon mit 2 Euro im Monat. Alle Infos hierzu und wie ihr uns abonnieren könnt, gibt es auf www.dissenspodcast.de. Das war der Dissens Podcast für diese Woche. Wir freuen uns über Kommentare und Anregungen. Danke fürs Zuhören und bis nächste Woche. Musik